I, I wasn't born in Jamaica. I was born here in the UK. My father and my mother are, are Jamaicans, which um, at the end of the day make me a Jamaican too. If you understand what I mean. Um, I was born here in 1957, right here in Nottingham. One of the first generation of the modern black youth, you could say, at that time. My interest started as a very young person in music and Jamaican reggae music. I, you know, I used to listen to the radio and hear all the early days pop music from Cilla Black, the Beatles, you know, some American artists back in the days that they used to play on the radio. But when, when our family came from Jamaica and we grew up, we were born and grew up into it, we were hearing all this different type of reggae music, you know, some call it ska, some call it blue beat. It was all different eras, so it changed and the name changed as it went along. Um, my father used to keep, you know, house parties during the bank holiday periods, like Easter time, people were off from work, and, you know, we, 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 going to a pub wasn't our thing back in them days because you know it, it was there was a lot of racism around so you know they used to have a lot of problems trying to share the pubs around the city so what happened is we started to keep our own house parties which um, after a while developed into the blues party It would start around 7 o'clock in the evening, 8 o'clock, long before the pub hours was over. But what would happen, you know, I'm, I'm there thinking, why is this guy pushing all these big wardrobe things into this house? And why is dad around the kitchen stacking drinks, crates, you know, baby sham, cherry bee, guineas, you know, long life. Those were the beers and the stuff I saw in them days. Wooden crates stacked from the floor to the ceiling. And my mum's got this enormous pot on the fire. And it smells so delicious because I know it's curry goat because we, we have it sometimes in, in our cuisines when she used to do our dinners and stuff. And um, I'm wondering, why is this guy putting this big metal box with all these lights on it in the house? Why are the rooms emptied on the ground floor and the furnitures of the interior? Anyway, it went on and then the music would start up, you know, the music man would, and I'd hear this, you know, not normal radiogram type of music, but this heavy dropping, blasting, powerful sounding thing, punching the music, they're making them sound different. Um, going up to probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock, you know, guys and their girlfriends would start coming in, walking in with their glasses on, dark glasses and their suits, you know, looking well sharp and spruce. The ladies just the same. Uh, this was my first reckoning of the house party and understanding what was going on after a few times it had happened. It's something that, um, I enjoy it because me and my brother Ruben, we used to sit at the top of the stairs in the early hours watching the people come in. Mum and Dad would be saying, it's time for your beds, guys. It's time for your beds. And I'm thinking, I'm going to sleep with, with all this. But it was fun, you know. Um, we'd sit there at the top of the step and we'd both fall asleep like this, heads together. And we'd just feel somebody pick us up like that. And the next thing we'd be in bed and we'd wake up the next morning. The party would be over. Um, a couple of the, uh, my dad's friends and himself would be cleaning the rooms out, getting rid of the empty cans and disinfectant in the room back and moving stuff back in. And that was it. That was the blues party. Like, you know, you're when you become a parent and you're young, parents always want you to be how they were. But, you know, even you, me being a parent now, I have to learn to accept that this is how my children are and I can't live my, my life for them. I think it was this um, 
poet called Khalil Gibran, uh, Lebanese, I think he is, said, your children are not your children. They're the gift. So, you know, like, we are a gift of our parents and our children are a gift of us. So we want to go out at night and they're thinking you should go to bed and stuff like that. So they like be like four of us used to go around. There was five of us. Then one of us, one of them drifted away, go to do other things. But then there was four of us left. So they always come, like my friend come from St. Thomas, and my mother didn't like her. And you know, we have loads of little prejudices because she got short eh? And my mother used to say, I don't picky and rose. <laughs> they are called Carly Finko. I picky and rich. <laughs> she called him up. She was good. And she was whistling. And so I knew it's my time to get ready. So I have to wait till I, when my mom was going to bed. And I kind of look on the door, see if she fall asleep. Then I'd get dressed. So I would lay down in the bed dressed, you know, ready to go out. Just kind of just waiting for the light to go out. So this night now i got my shoes. Because you can't go down, you know, them kids there. Go on the ground on the stairs, put your shoes under your arm and step out, click the door. It's nice. And then go through. Then it's snowing outside and even like I didn't even trust to put my shoes on till I get around the corner. So I'm walking on that cold house and going to meet my friend on the corner and we haven't gone to party. She said, are you going to get out? I said, oh, my mom's gone to sleep. She said, oh, all right. No, let's go. We've gone down to party. Must have buzzed in about, about four, four parties before the night started and I'm coming home. And like the, the landlord lived downstairs and um, I didn't really know that he was up, or he even noticed that I came went through the door because I did. We learn, you learn quite quickly how to do things for your benefit. We learn how to take the latch off the thing without the door slamming and stuff, you know, all kinds of little tricks. We'll do it in the daytime to make sure it works. So when you're going out at night, you know it's going to work and they're not going to catch you, yeah? When I come back now in the night, doing it real feeling sweet. And I switch the light on. Oh my. Just as I put my hand on the light to switch the light on, Mr. Miller come and put his cold hands on my hands. He said, You think me never wait for you to come in tonight? I screamed. But when Clifton came on the scene now, it was a big following of young people, middle people, whatever people, but he carried the sway for a long, long time. And when you go to his party, it was like ram party. You're coming from club and everybody said, boy, me, I got Clifton, you know, I can't just say things are going, big things are going down there. So everybody dress up now and we got a Clifton party. And Clifton is a bad man, you know. Uh, you know, Clifton is a bad man, you know. People going to other people's parties and fight. Nah, you can't fight. Because him and his brother, they would just lift them and put them outside. You know, nobody can fight in Clifton's parties, but he was, he had a really good following of people and his party was always a ram pack. I'm telling you, even people outside standing up, they can't go in because it's so packed. But the music as well was that good that people would be dancing outside even because like they can't get into the house. Because remember, didn't that, remember our halls and then fancy something like now people want big time community centre to keep parties. It was always in the houses. So you know like people have one room and then you have the passageway and stuff like that and you can only dance in there. And you have the people who live on top where they might come down and say, Oh no tap your nice no oh, no think I don't know one people have to work on oh, no, work. Oh no, I met nice never call police and all that kind of thing there but then but the funny thing about the police as well, right? Them come and they eat off your curry goat and so <laughs> And then come and get the drink. Um, many years ago, um, I got my, my first house and I needed to furnish this house. So I decided I'd have to have a series of blues parties. And um, unfortunately, one bank holiday weekend, um, when I planned to have one of the, the final blueses, weekend. Um, I got home and um, couldn't get into my house. Council put a big old padlock through the, the letterbox and notice on the door. So I'd gone down to the council office and said, look, I'm not leaving here with my children until you let me in my property. And eventually I got back in my house and decided I'm still going to have the blues anyway. And I, the house was empty. 
Um, and I was living in, in one room and, and obviously the kids weren't there. Um, and I'd gone to bed, you know, because I could sleep through anything. I'd, I think we'd done like eight weeks and I was tired. I'd gone to bed and then I heard singing and I got out of bed and me being me, you know, my head's wrapped up and I think I had on leggings and a vest top, come downstairs, walked into the living room. There's far too many people in this house. And I know that voice. So a friend of mine came up to me, said that the dance at Marcus Garvey had come to an end, there'd been some trouble, um, and Stone Love was playing, and she's like, they're in your house. I've never moved so quick in my life. I ran upstairs to get changed. You, you've never seen anybody get dressed, full hair, tongued, makeup, outfit, to come back downstairs looking trash and ready. So yeah, you know, that, that's a memory I'll always take. You know, it, it stays with me. I went out with my aunt quite a bit. My aunt and my cousin, um, they're friends. Um, my aunt's nine years older than me, so she kind of led the way. Um, and there were places like Acne Centre that we used to go to, Marcus Garvey, um, Talio. There were a few pubs dotted around the city that we went to as well. Um, lots of blues parties and shubins, and thankfully my mum's no longer here to hear me saying this. But, um, yeah, there were lots of venues that really shouldn't have been, especially at my age. Um, but, um, yeah, I did. And it was, just, it was just a different time, you know, where I think now if, if we had those scenes now, people would be really quite cautious. But, you know, I'd roll up into a blues on my own. There's no lights in a blues, you know. It's a bag of people. It's wall to wall, door to door. You know, there's no exit. I'd be in a blues on my own because nobody else wanted to go out. Not a problem to me. Would I do that now? Maybe not, but I'm glad that I had that experience because everybody was free, you know, and that's what reggae music gives you. It gives you the opportunity to just be yourself. When Lovers Rock came in as well, a lot of women became a bit more independent. You find like more women, they're dancing together and they, you know, like, so it changes the whole social structure in terms of what men and women were about then, because uh, women were gained so much more independence. A lot of them were born here as well. So some of them are just coming to mid-teens and, and 20s. So like the whole tenor change, whereas we came here from the Caribbean. Uh, some of us did not even know nothing about going to dance or anything like that. So I think that's one of the reasons why you'd want to sneak out to go to dance, you know what I mean? Um, Nottingham had a great dance scene, you know. You could literally rave in Nottingham seven nights a week. Um, bank holidays were amazing because you'd have all dayers, you know, all day would finish at midnight, you know, start at like one in the afternoon, finish at midnight, and then you'd dash home, get baffed and changed and then you'd be on to an all-nighter, you know, mum would call it the vampire area, you know, where all I did was sleep during the day and, and rave at night, but bank holiday weekends were just, you know, everyone prepared. Who wasn't having an outfit made, having their hair done, you know, it was definitely a time where for women, they were competing, but it was with their fashion, but they were competing in a way where they wanted to go outside of what the standard shops were, were selling, you know, so they wanted to be really, really creative. And I remember having outfits that had one arm and half a leg and no back and my mum saying, oh, where's the rest of your clothes? You can't see a near kid. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a time for expression. These parties would go on in our area it had spread across to the St. Anne's area, the Hyson Green area. There was blues, you know, people used to just put their blues on. Back in them days, you had the sound men, them like Father. That was his name, Father. His sound was a nice, heavy dropping sound as far as I can remember. Then came Doctor, them two guys, Father and Doctor, were the two main guys for the helders at the time and the blues goers, the party goers at that time. 
And um, you had another gentleman called Johnny. He had a good playing sound as well. He came from around the Colville Street area, I think, if I remember right. And those were the three main sounds. Over the years, as uh, we came into the mid-60s, you know, you get people like um, Sun Task, which became Buster, and um, Clifton arrived in the early 60s from London, dominating the field. At that time, in the early 60s, the mid 60s, when Clifton came in, you also had the mighty V Rocket, who was there a bit before that time, you know, and they were playing around as well in the house parties. Doctor and Father and Johnny now had past their stage. They were from in the 50s coming up. They were the first, you know, flagships that came here and brought this, just like Duke Reed in London, Sir Coxon, you know, Lloyd Coxon, and many of other sounds that came up in the South. Birmingham, Chin Sound City, Duke Halloy, you know, back in the days, you know, th these were the sounds that were around in the mid 60s up to the late 70s into a part of the 80s. In the first, first man who built a sound in Nottingham. The first black man that built a sound in Nottingham here. And all them look them, we rock it, all of them come. They built after me. You see. I am the proper writer. Come here in 1956, 24th of March, came in this country here. You see, live at Robin Hood Chase. 60 Robin, 60 Robin Hood Chase. That's where I come to Mr. this. The white people, they was not nice to us, you see. You see on the door, you see on the door, you knock on the door and also, also rent toilet. <clears throat> they don't want to turn away, they shut the door in your face. And go back to your black boss. <laughs> in the 50s, it was terrible. Teddy boys, them, oh God, it was terrible. Riot. Oh, believe you me, it was terrible. That's it. And I said, all right, Bill Music, 1957. That's all right, I want this music to get everybody together, to black and white come together. And that's where I start from. My son, what I built was named Count Lenodi. You see, that's my son. As you know, we wasn't allowed, black people wasn't allowed into clubs. So they had to create their own entertainment. So because they used to listen to a sound in their younger days in Jamaica called V Rocket, they created this 50 watt house party set and they would play, it would play at blues parties here in Nottingham. So that's where I would start, a little 50 watt sound system. Well, the blues them days was mostly Cramer Street. Cramer Street is based in St. Anne's. Also, most of the blues them used to be Union Road, Peel Street, Cramer Street, Alfred Street. Those was the, 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 the areas in them time. My, my, my parents used to run like a little gambling, you know, cook food and you come and play a little domino and card and buy a little food. And as a young girl growing up, used to, you know, I witnessed them things. 
So them are the areas where we really used to have the blues part in them. Coxon was the sound that my brothers and their schoolmates, Parliament and Ruben, really looked up to. Coxon was the sound that they idolised. When Coxon used to come to Nottingham to play, you have to go buy your outfit. Cause you know, like when the circus come to town and the kids them want to go to the circus, well, when Coxon come at Nottingham to play, you have to be there. This is the big one. So the guys them used to look up to Coxon as the sound that them would like to be like. So, you know, we have to big up Festus and Lydie and all them, Denzel and all the man them from them days. Cause them was the, the sound where we really look up to. The first night me hear Lydie Coxon song. It's not so much the music where I play in a kind of tune, everybody don't know. But the first night me and was in a club in town here in Nottingham named the Coleman's. Right? It's not so much the music where I did I play. Yes, the music too, but it's the style and pattern where I'm selector and operator perform the music in a Festus was a was a was a Jai for just stand up and admire and look at when he might play a coxswain song and a DJ the mic. And like I could remember even back in those days as well, where they, when you wanted to hear a particular tune, a lot, you had to go and listen to a particular sound. I mean, an example I can say, Coxon. Coxon, I remember they had a tune, Lee Perry production, on the ground roots. Now, before it came out on, it eventually came out on a Lee Perry album, but before it came out, Coxon was the only sound playing it. So if you want this tune, everybody loved this tune, so if you wanted to hear this tune, you had to go and listen to Coxon. Call Ruben and Valerie. We never see a people like them love dub plate. <laughs> them fight some tune. A job here for the three months we're down there. Every day them that studio, you know. Valerie live at the studio with Ruben every day. Ruben have all tune with Bobby just said to mix it, Ruben and Ruben mix it. A bad cock up to your rhythm track. Where we have. I cock up to the vocal to it. And so we build the tune them. Proper thing. So when we spend a three month now, Jamaica and come back here, 87. A gash where a gash fire, anything moved dead. And that's how it became. Saxon man in tangle with we man rubber unity. The man them come in like them so oh, you're not liquid over so easy, you know. We said, well, me we'll go to that cow and I big sound them. And I put them in one kill. You know? Coxon, dearly respect because Festus, gun smoke, a dem man there, me and my brother, groom myself off as youth and youth are come. Reuben and Parliament is like a mini version to gun smoke and Festus and lie to them. I would say, well, hey, Granville, we got a son out there and we, we, we want to come in and play with you guys. So, Granville said, okay, okay. <laughs> and we brought in all we had was two little boxes with two 15 inch bass speakers and two little ones with a couple of 12 inches to play the tops with some capacitors on them so they play that kind of midi trebly sound. No tweeters, nothing like that, them time. And Granville, he's got about eight stacks around the whole hall. And when he lets it off right, it's like the roof is coming in. And we strung up, man, and we said, boys, he's going to mash us up, but we've got to play still. And when we came on, when he said, when we got our microphone on and said, testing, testing, one, two, time for our check. This brother, he's up and it's all right, check, Granville. So we come in. When we came in, 
I've, I, I said to us, I'm sorry we came. We're going to get hammered in here. Our two liquor boxes was just lost in that crowd. All you could hear it was just filtering through, just barely filtering through. And when you go for the bass, I'm thinking so much wrong with the amplifier. It's just been sucked off, mate. You get me? And I'm thinking we're dead. But what we had was the tune. And we had a crowd with us. And every time we played, right, we got a wicked response. Because we're playing what they're not hearing up here, right? And Granville would come in with his bad boy tune, you know, rock the place with his bass, man, and we'd be silly over there with bass, licking us. But then we'd come in again and we'd say, all right, Granville, you have the big song, but we have the tune tonight. And we'd draw some tune. And the crowd would respond again. Even his supporters were responding to it. As little as the sound was, we created an impact that night. And things like that just pushed us and pushed us. And our technician at the time was Legs the Giant. The Legs, we call him, his real name was Carl. He built um, the valve amplifiers that we had. We moved from one which we started with when me and my brother joined up with Rocket to, to a, a second one which we bought in. Car, <coughs> we wanted to be bigger. We wanted to play quad boxes, double boxes. So obviously we had to increase the power. And then from that, we went to a piece of 600. So we ended up with three solid, well-made piece of valve amp, which we'd link them all together and wire the boxes to them. And that would give us the extra power to spread the sound into bigger venues. From there, Legs came up with the transistor eyes. He says he's got something he needs us to try and thinks that this is the way forward now, valves are being put down. So um, we, we moved over to the transistorized, he built us two nice pieces of transistorized amplifiers, they were like a thousand watt each at the time. I've walked into this blues and it's the first time I'm going to hear a sound called Sir D's, which became the unity after many years when Robert became the front man for it at that time. And that night, Admiral Ken was playing tune, but the Sir D's, he played tune for us. So on the morning when we got up and got to Frinsby Park at the record shop, as we went in, the first tune came off was what we heard Sir D, one of what we heard Sir D's playing, and we said, give us that. And the next one was one of what we heard Sadis played and we said, give us that. <laughs> we bought about £14 worth of tune costs. We said we had to keep some money to buy ourselves something to eat when we're going home later. And we ended up with a um, couple of LPs and a box of 7-inch and we came back to Nottingham with these records and we fired up the following Thursday night and telling everybody how much new tunes we got. And that's where it began. The next thing I know, the YMCA, Thursday Night Disco, it just grew and grew and grew. And people started talking about this little sound of City. And that's when we realised that people like Scabway from Tropical Sound System, even Clifton, they pop in. This is a youth club, but these are big men, and I'm thinking, what's going on? They're all coming to listen to us because they've heard that we're playing some wicked tune as a little Ute Man sound, they used to call it then. That made us the first ever Youth Man sound in the Midlands. In the Midlands. There, there wasn't a Ute Man sound before Dub City. The one to come after us was Quantratone. And then after them it was Earthquake. Well, I used to play a song called Quantra. And, you know, most of we, we used to kind of try to muggle off Shaka <laughs> back in the day, because our sound was more of like a, you know, and, you know, in them times in the 70s, like when I'm talking about the early 70s, you know what I'm saying? Them time, you know, there was a lot of Rasta around, and our sound was more of like a Rasta sound still. It 
the shaka you have to respect because you see some people is just all the same foundation and and people still want that. Shaka amazes me because Shaka, he has not changed one iota from the first time I heard that sound in 1978. He has not changed nothing and he comes across exactly the same. And I'm convinced he's got the same hum, same boxes, same everything. And I hear him playing those tunes. Shaka, that's, oh gosh, that's another story I can give you, man. I remember the first time I heard Shaka. It's like he baptized me. Because I could remember before I heard Shaka, like a couple of them, of brethren them had heard Shaka before. And they was telling me, boy, crucial, you want to hear this sign here, man? Shaka, he's just, you know, he's just different and he's got his effects and everything. And that. But I couldn't imagine it because everybody, the way I everybody, nobody was playing sound like him. So I said, no, man, I got to see this because to the way how everybody was playing sound, this is not what they was describing to me. This sounded different. And I remember when I first heard him, it was MFM, Northampton. It was Quantra, Quaker City from Birmingham. Quantra from here, Quaker City from Birmingham and Jashaka. And I remember we got there because we was moving with Quantra and then we got there and went in the dance and like, Quantra had set up, Quaker City had set up, playing and everything, and no shaka. And I was a bit disappointed now, because this is the first time I'm going to hear, and, I, and like he hasn't even turned up. And I thought, damn. And then, next thing, I seen the lights come on. And then I seen him walking, you know, his crew walking, and I seen, oh, he say yes, and the lights come on, and he, he came in the dance, and he set up. And I remember they had to move boxes and all this kind of thing. And it, people was in there, it kind of disrupted the dance, but I wasn't bothered as long as Shocker was coming in there. And he came in and I remember he strung up, they had a kind of a stage. It's not exactly a stage, it's just a higher part of the club where it's at the back and the, you go up the stairs and that was the only sp space that he had to actually set up. I remember he set up, but this was 1978. 78, late 78, early 79, around that time. I remember it turned on. And like, that, that was what impressed me, his big light box. And I could remember some of my brethren them saying, boy, it's the first I've seen that, you know what I mean? So he had introduced this big, you know, with his flashing jashaka, he had first introduced it then. And he's strung up and like, it, and I never, the, tune, the first tune he signed on with, Fort Augustus tune at Elgardo. This is the first time I've heard this tune. And I was in awe. So, wow, which tune is this? And the second tune he came on with, Dennis Brown, Don't Want to Be a General. I was baptized. <laughs> I was, never, that is one of the biggest highlights in my life. But, I was standing in the middle of the, and that's how I was. And the first tune he came on with, Juna Delgado, Fort Augustus. And the next tune he played. Because I always, I, always, I used to think that Don't Want to Be a General was his special. Because I don't know if you know the tune, Dennis Brown, and it's got that woo, 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 woo. That was an effect that Shaka used to use on his sound. So when I'm hearing this in the record now, I'm thinking, wait, is this a, Shocker exclusive or something. Because the first time I'm hearing the tune, remember I'm up in music them times. I was well up in music and these are the first times I'm hearing these tunes. And from that, Shocker just baptized me, man. Thought, nah, Shocker. And he's, he's maintained it. And this is my very first experience of going on the dance and um, we strung the sound up. You went away, then you come back to turn it back on when everybody's turned up. So we come back to turn it back on. And I opened the doors and I could not believe, you know, Rasta men. In, the, in them days, Rasta was Rasta. You had your binds, you know, then your short trousers and your, your green jacket. And I can always remember opening the doors and oh, good, oh, good. And the building shaking, brrr, brrr, the bass line. And from there, I was just like, just totally hooked. You know, there was no other thing like it I've never seen in my life. And um, we used to play like, say, Quantro, Earthquake, Skyrocket, V-Rocket in them days.
I was introduced to the Sono. I came in and started the management side of it. Got to Jamaica, set up with dub plates, them from Channel One and King Tubby's, King Jammies, and and start get with music coming regular and have a more organized thing. And we decided to make things a bit different. Those days we used to have entertainers, singers, so you play, you have one, one turntable. You play the vocal, you flip over the B side, and you have your singer, sing on it, and you have your DJ. So where we start to know, to get recognition, we started to bring artists from Jamaica. We used to have a local car. Rankin used to DJ. Rankin was a, he was influenced by people like you, Rai, and I, Rai. So it's a man when he take the mic and said, way down south where the little brother used to play, you know, and do him little thing. And we have one of our little family named Scraper Bantan. So they was the, the, the predominantly the man them who used to operate, talk and select and play the song until we start bringing in different artists. Every month we'd have sent for a different artist. We're responsible bringing crazy amount of artists for work life on the song. Shabba, Choose the Wheel, Charlie Chaplin, Brigadier Jerry, Oris Andy. I, I could, uh, next week have me for name, I'd be naming lecturer. Crazy amount of people come in and work on the song. It was different. It was, it was unique because there wasn't any other female that was um, running a sound system, you know. So people end up calling me. Why go on racket? We are a lady V. So I ended up being recognised as the only female that was predominantly involved in the sound system culture in the UK. Um, until all of that started to filter out um, internationally. Um, so it, it was different and I gained a lot of respect because um, I knew my history, I knew the technical side of the sound system as well as gathering in the music. But it's always been a teamwork with the rest of the, the, the crew, with my brother, with Parliament, with Ruben. And currently now we have our siblings, which is the greatest thing for me, because it's always been a family sound that's been handed down through the generations. You know, from my mum and dad, my oldest brother, to my second eldest brother, to myself, Ruben, Parliament. And now we've got younger siblings, Selector Belly, Val B, my son, Amali, and other, other members of the family that is very much affiliated and a part of the sound. So it's, it's passing down again to the younger generation of who's been involved with it from back in the days. I think it's, 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 it's unique when the ladies them can go up and show the man them that we know our things too. You know, we know our history, we know how to play good music, and we know how to address our audience. So yes, I think it does bring a unique thing and a difference to, to the everyday dances. So I noticed in England, our own kind of thing was created, hence us creating Lovers Rock, which to me is one of the best music in the reggae music genre, which I don't understand for the life of me why that didn't get big and international. For up to this day, I just don't understand it. Top notch in Nottingham, is probably like um, how Maxi Priest and them lot were responsible for a lot of the children that were born of that era, because the Lovers Rock thing was what we specialised in, and the Lovers Rock has its 
chain reaction in its musical field. And I'm very proud to say that, you know, as a young British black guy being involved in that, I'm responsible for many a children that are floating around Nottingham today. <laughs> used to be a sound called Jungle Lion and I used to follow them and then some of them branched off into Success who my brothers were also with and Paul and um, Martin and a few others and I used to do specials for them so that when they had like the sound clash they'd chalk them on and wash up the next sound so that's what I used to do for them and that's that sort of like brought me into doing what I do now because I do I sing Lovers Rock now um, so that had a big impact on me you know, music-wise. And back then time there, it was shop amps that we used to have because we couldn't afford, like, the bigger sounds them to have a man bill of amp for you, you know? But Top Notch has always been a very sort of a... How do I call Top Notch? A big stereo. Not so much a sound system, it was a big stereo, you know what I mean? But it, it used to deliver a sound that the women liked, and that's all we used to work to. Like I said, our, our, our motto was the women. Please the women, not business about the man. Because there isn't a man who wouldn't be out there and say, when you hear top notch party, yeah man, me I go, me I go. You know what I mean? Got Wally Puggy Aldi there. And that's how they were. When you did dance with somebody, it was very nice because you wanted to dance with them. So, but the strange thing was that at the end of the dance, it was kind of, that was it. <laughs> Not that you watch anymore, <laughs> but um, it, you kind of, the dance was it. The, that dance was your time together. <laughs> when we first started, um, we, like, we played a lot of parties. So Lovers Rock, was a lot, you know, a lot of stuff. And we used to play with, we used to live in Dory, because his sound was top notch at the time. Mm. And we used to play a lot together, parties and, and Between success and top notch, we pulled the crowd. We pulled the crowd in big time. And so Lovers Rock was a lot of what, the, what they want, really wanted to hear. Mm. Um, that was the also, era. Yeah, and then also we went into the dance hall, because we used to have a lot of talent people around the sound, because we had youth symbols coming around DJing singing and we had girl singers we, had, we used to get them all over coming to want to come on our side we still look at jamaica as the origin of sound system and stuff like that and then we still look at the english form because what you know if i'm being honest what really exploded us to really want to go out there and do things is when i was listening to sounds like fat man Cox and Saxon was a great impact to us. Sounds like Unity, you know. It was a, a you know, they, they were sound systems that you looked and you said, right, I'm going, because I'm going to get entertained, I'm going to hear something different.